We marched back from Saspel about 40 miles, took some what they called uh, 40 and 8. It's an old World War I French boxcar that took us up to uh, Soissons. And we went up there. We arrived on the 6th of December made preparation for a Christmas party and refitting and all that. We turned all our equipment in because we was coming back to the States. We had served our time. I had enough points. You went by points then. If you had enough points, you went home. Like most of the American troops still in Europe, the men of the 517th thought they were going home. After many hard-fought battles, they had succeeded in every mission. Hitler was now on the run and the Allied forces believed the war would be over by Christmas. All of a sudden, the rumor was that the Germans had broken through in, in the Ardennes, and we were, the 82nd had already gone, the 101st were already gone, and we were pulling out ourselves. But we were called up that quickly because this was a major, major breakthrough, and we didn't know how far they were going or, or what, the, what the, the true military situation was. In fact, no one knew the true situation, not even most of the German forces. Hitler's last desperate stand was a secret. He knew he had lost the war, but hoped a win in Belgium would deliver a favorable peace treaty for Germany. To accomplish this mission, he unleashed his finest SS troops, outnumbering the U.S. three to one. To attack, they would use the element of surprise in the middle of a cold and unforgiving winter. We didn't know where the front was. The front was so liquid at that point, we had put people out in front of us, <clears throat> supposed to uh, tell us where we were supposed to engage the enemy, what our job was, what our mission was. But it was a very uh, uh, liquid situation. We had no idea where in the hell we were going. We, it was a rainy night, and uh, Everybody was on edge because the reports were that German parachutists had dropped and that they were changing the road signs and all of this. And coming out of the bulge that were our tanks. Our tanks were no match for their tanks. So they were pulling out and we're going in in, half, in two and a half ton trucks with just canvas covering, which didn't make us feel too well. It was snowing and we didn't have sleeping bags. We didn't have hot food. We weren't even sure we had our weapons, and some didn't. No boots, just, just shoes, socks, and regular pants, and a coat. We took quite a beating during the bulge. Uh, you know, besides wounds, frozen feet, quite a contrast from the Riviera to two feet of snow, and we weren't really equipped for that type of weather. And they used us as firemen. I remember when we first went up there, we were attached to the 30th Division. And then later on, we were attached to the 106th Division. And then the 78th Division, 3rd Armored, 7th Armored. They just used us all over hell. They would just plug us in wherever they needed uh, an empty space to be filled. But we didn't have the, the, the cloak of a division to provide us with the support that we needed. And it's a wonder we weren't totally annihilated because of that. And we reported to General Ridgeway. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And he told his chief of staff, any youth that came in and reported in, he wanted to brief them. The Boyle's outfit was the first to come in, the first battalion. And they, they immediately got into a fight uh, down around a, a little town called Otan. The situation demanded immediate action. The first battalion's mission was to clear the area of soy and hotton and established a stable line of resistance between the two towns. Separated from their battalion, part of B and C Company were ordered by General Rose to join Task Force Kane at the hottest spot on the Western Front. The rest of the battalion was about to run into trouble. We unloaded the trucks back in the hills and walked up to this road and down, and that was mined, and we happened to watch that. Made our way through the fields at night in the snow, it was up this to your belly button. It was bad. No boots. I had newspaper wrapped around my feet. We got near the 
town of Houghton, which was about 20 miles away, I think. We got there early in the morning, and it was a real firefight. We were attached to a tank unit, and were instructed to follow the old infantry school routine of having the tanks with the infantry dispersed among them. But the tanks were drawing fire, and the infantry was being shot up between Suey and Houghton, where I took off. One of our tanks was on fire, and there was somebody trapped inside. So I climbed into the tank and helped pull the fellow out and got him on the ground. And at that time, the Germans zeroed in on the tank and shot me. And it was a real firefight. And the Germans knew he was there. And the third armored tanks helped us. They showed up from somewhere. If it hadn't been for them, we, we would have been annihilated. We called for the medics for a stretcher, and they came down, and that's when the German tank shot at us and got me again. This time, it complete severance of the foot or the leg. So I got out my jump knife, and I told my aide to cut, my, cut it off. He got down on his knees, and the tears came down his face. He says, I can't do it, Captain. <laughs> I told him to cut it off. It was two days before Christmas 1944 when Captain Ely was wounded for a second time. He was saved by medics and transported to a field hospital. For his brave service, Captain Earl Ely was awarded the Silver Star. We got into town of Houghton. We went to a church. We all laid around the wall and the shells was going off. Some was hitting the church, some weren't. They was hitting a lot of houses close by. The Germans were shelling us bad. The Germans were going down the road with the tanks. Oh, we just didn't know what the hell to do. It's... And finally, we got some tank support. And so we got rid of the Germans. And the Germans, when we got to the end of the row of houses, had their dead all rolled up in rows. It's the first I'd ever seen that. The 1st Battalion had accomplished their mission. Colonel Boyle was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the 1st Battalion a Presidential Distinguished Unit Citation. It had been a rough four days. On the wall, they had a big situation map. And I went over to the map and looking and finally found Manhay. And it looked like the whole damn German army was in and on Manhay. And I thought to myself, my God, am I glad I'm not involved in that one. We left Mammaldy Christmas Day. We soon got orders. It was sent to headquarters, General Ridgeway, wanted Manhay taken that night at all cost. The battalion only had two companies at the time. G Company was guarding Corps headquarters. So they had I Company and H Company were the only two. American troops had been driven out of there twice. Man, it was just a village. We got orders in the afternoon that we were going to attack Manhay that night. They're in the forest, and they're in column, and I'm walking along the column, and uh, ran into Berger, and he said, look, Gibbons, he says, I don't have time to brief you on what's going on here. He said, but get on the end of the column, which was end of I Company, and uh, keep, them, keep them moving. What's going to happen, he said, we're going to have artillery, and then that's going to lift, and then they're gonna, we're going to go across the field, and they'll put artillery on the town, and then we'll go into the town. At dusk of an evening, we get into a, field, a line of departure in a field someplace. I get on the end of the column. H Company's behind I Company. Again, in column. The reason you're in column, it's night. You're in the woods, and uh, you don't want to get lost, so you follow close the guy behind you. Two o'clock in the morning, there was going to be a heavy artillery barrage on Manhay. It was one of the heaviest artillery barrages of the war. They tried to take it. Uh, in the afternoon, I understand, with two battalions and didn't make it. 
here we've got two shot up companies are going to try to uh, take this town. At two o'clock in the morning, this barrage started up. It lasted for five or ten minutes. And this terrific barrage shook the ground, and we could see where they were going, there, like on fire or something. And I thought it was German artillery, and really, really right on top of it, like to bounce. And it stopped, and we advanced, I, I don't know, a short distance, probably so many yards, and one artillery battery didn't raise the guns, and their artillery fell on top of us. I company was the lead company, and I was an H company behind them. Landed on the head of I company, and uh, as we were going along column, I get up to there, and here there's guys helping the wounded. Them screaming and cursing, and, but we had orders not to stop. I'm yelling, come on, get going, leave them alone. The aides will take care of them. Let's get going because we've got to get in that damn town before they, those Germans get their heads up. Because right. if they get their heads up, out of, we're never going to take the town, if we're going to take it anyway. We captured it without very little problem. The Germans had been wiped out by the artillery barrage, and the only ones there were hiding in cellars. And we go in and we take the town. And I'm the most surprised guy in the world. The 3rd Battalion took Manhay on December 27, 1944. It was the first territory retaken from the Nazis and began to turn the bulge inside out. Three o'clock in the afternoon, I got a message from regiment that I would move over, relieve the 2nd Battalion of 505, attack and seize trap points, continue the attack to seize Montefosse. I want to see, you know, how close can I get to the objective I'm going to take tomorrow? What's the terrain like? What's the enemy's strength? You know, I want to find out everything so we can make a plan. But I get there and it's dark. In, in Belgium in January, the beginning of evening nautical twilight is about 4.30 or quarter to 5. So I get there and I talk to Ben Vandervoort, who is a battalion commander. I remember his famous words. He says, Dick, there's nobody out there. Bunch of old men. <laughs> you know, I thought about that for 65 years. So I made a damn plan to attack by, uh, from the map. That's bad. So we took off approximately 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we were to take Trapont. No trouble taking Trap points. Went like clockwork. But the Germans really didn't want to fight a whole hell of a lot. It's when I turn 10 degrees to take Montefoss. And that was the worst orders we had received, to go straight up a mountain. Montefoss is on a hill about 14, 1,500 yards away. It looks like just a sea out there. There's no vegetation, nothing. I know there's just a bunch of old men up there. So we attack. And we had to cross open field and uh, it, it looked like a cemetery because there were graves that were, that were uh, dug and uh, unbeknownst to us, they, they, they were zeroed in with uh, enemy mortar. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. It turns out there's a reinforced battalion up there. Of course, they've been there for a couple days. They've got every depression zeroed in with mortars. They have interlocking fires with their machine guns. Being a scout, I was out there with the uh, head of the group of my company, and uh, they started shelling us pretty bad. And uh, I got behind a, uh, a, a berm, and it wasn't long before 
a, uh, I'm, to this day, I don't know if it was a German 88 or a big mortar that uh, fell right near me, and it killed company commander John Castleman, and it wounded two other guys, and I never got a scratch. It was a concussion. And this was January 3rd, as I said, and it was about the first week in February that uh, I woke up from, from a coma. I've never seen such withering fire. Every time a man moved, he was shocked. We lost 19 men killed, and I think it was close to 100 wounded. My best buddy at that time was killed, and the sad part about it is he begged not to die. He says, I don't, don't want to die, but it was too late. He, that was the, the closest friend or buddy that I had that was killed in that battle. I told regiment I needed some help that I was not gonna move anybody. I said, every time somebody moves, they get shot. I need some tanks, and I need some artillery fire. Well, about four o'clock, a platoon of TDs came out of the woods. Six of them, first three were knocked out by direct fire by the Germans. The other three withdrew. I told my people, stay absolutely flat, Come dark, we'll move, we'll get out of this goddamn place. There were several battles that I didn't think we would make it through, but I personally was fired at so many times and so many bullets landed around me that I felt that some way I would make it, and I did. Most of the troopers made it after Colonel Boyle and his 1st Battalion brought reinforcement relief. The 1st Battalion would move up around my right after dark, and that's what Bill Boyle did. Bill got wounded there behind Monty Foss. But that's the worst day of my life, and I think about it all the time. The remnants of the 517th 2nd Battalion made it out and rested for a few days. They were then attached to the 7th Army Division and assigned to recapture St. Vith, but first they must take the village of Honage. Just before the tanks were to move, we'd fire a T.O.T. on Honage. We got 17 battalions of artillery. Now 17 battalion at 17 times 12. Every one of those guns firing a round on Honage at that exact time. Just getting dark and having these tanks, I mean, you got 12 tanks on line. Those cannons made that blast at night. Firing these damn machine guns. My mortars firing like hell on them. I tell you, it was like the 4th of July. I, I almost got to the point sometimes that I felt sorry for the Germans. <laughs> the tanks are moving. They moved through the damn infantry, arrived on Honeach. Hell, the Germans are shell-shocked. They had the uh, reserve company continue to move through Honeach, down about halfway up to Asant Vif in a pretty good defensive position along the main road leading into Saint Vip with a platoon of tanks in case we got a counterattack. We had our tanks fighting the German tanks, and so that was helping us know where they were. But we found out the next day when the Germans pulled out of Hunnage, they all pulled out like a bunch of rats out of Saint Vip. I was twice wounded. Frozen feet, frozen hand. Well, I just wished that I had been, I don't know, quicker, I guess. Yeah.
They had to leave a lot of good men. St. Vith ended the Battle of the Bulge. The 517th Regiment was recommended for the Presidential Citation for Great Heroic Action. After the Belgian Bulge was pushed back to the German line, the Allied forces pressed on into Germany to force a surrender. Their first mission was to take the town of Schmidt to prevent the Germans from releasing the dam surrounding the area and literally drowning attacking forces. They had just four days to do it. Along the way, the 517th was unexpectedly diverted to the village of Bergstein. The most direct path was through the Hurtgen Forest, where the enemy had prepared the strongest defenses of the Western Front. When you're in the Hurtgen Forest, it's like being in, at nightfall. It's just difficult to move. It was pouring rain, snow, you know, sleet, and that, and the division that had been fighting, try to break through, called for us to come up, and they couldn't break through. We moved in through the Black Forest, that we call it, into Bergstein. It was literally destroyed, the most destroyed village we had ever seen in Germany. And it was raining and very muddy, and we walked over bodies going into the town that night. Damn Germans have been there for weeks. There are all kinds of tank holes around the place where the Germans had fought on the edge of Hurtgen Force. Graves called the battalion commander and said, we're gonna make a night attack. We're not gonna fire any preparatory artillery. You know, we're gonna sneak up there. It was a mile and a half to the objective where they were to isolate the German forces by seizing the schmidt nittigen Road. We went through the biggest minefield in the history of any war at that time, and we snaked our way through in the middle of the night. Our engineers had probed us a way through it and had laid their ribbons, and we crawled on our bellies in the mud. And we, we was to go out, and each company was two companies meet, two companies meet three miles behind the lines. And they would, then we were to attack the next morning from there as this other outfit attacked. F Company was given a one inch piece of fluorescent tape, which we put in the back of our helmets. And of course the orders were, the fellow in front of you fell or anything happened to him, they fell out of hole. The fellow who was behind him was supposed to catch up with the column in front of him. But I think somebody fell in a hole and the fellow behind didn't do what he was supposed to do and tried to help the fellow out of the hole. and the column lost contact with one another. We was going through and every now and then, Juicy, our captain, he led the way and he was a great big tall head and a guy and uh, hard to keep up and we kind of got lost and they, every now and then. They, so we have to stop and let guys keep up because you're running in the mud and snow and everything else. He come back to me and he said, Traver, where's everybody behind you? I said, I don't know. I look back and they're gone. Those two platoons kept moving bless their damn hearts, they were eventually captured. But the, the Germans had moved right through that F company. Captain Juke said, let's go, we've got to get over there and get to where we're supposed to meet E company, it was a bridge. And we took off and he was, he was a great big guy jumping logs and everything else and, and then this other kid was little, and, but we kept up as best we could. And we did run on to this you know, German, just a kid. And we, we, he begged not to keep killing the kid, but he looked like he was about 13, 14, somewhere around there. And so we took him with us and we got up to where E Company was supposed to be. No one was there. While Juki, Traver, and Flynn were trapped behind enemy lines, the second and third battalions faced their own challenges. It is the black, black night and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Go, hit the ground. Remember that particular sound of a bullet going right past you? Think about church who said nothing is exhilarating as being shot at and missed. But yeah, I was just trying to hug the ground. Carson didn't have any artillery fire on these guys. 
and it's dark as hell and they've lit the place up. That's the reason you could see them. I mean, they, they made the place look like daylight. And again, it's the position. Every time a man moved, he'd get shot, so the troops are hugging the old <laughs> terrain. In the 517th, in our history of battle, we always made our mission. We were always successful. Some were very difficult, some were easier, but we were used to covering ground, being successful. And we got there and things weren't going right. We weren't taking anything. The men of the 517th were up against their own mirror image, the German paratroopers. Even at this late stage in the war, they were young, strong, and ready to die for their furor. I'm getting fire from my left. The third battalion's on my left. They got a pretty strong counterattack. And they withdrew. I didn't realize they were withdrawing. And the counterattack came between me and the second and first platoon of F Company. I halted our attack and then got word from regiment withdrawal with the third battalion, which we did. But I lost those two platoons of, of F Company. The battalions withdrew and returned to Bergstein to re strategize. The overriding problem was the massive minefields beneath the snow. The 596 engineers would work tirelessly for the next 36 hours to clear a path to resume attack. While the majority of the troops hunkered down in Bergstein, others lay in wait for relief. Captain Juki at that time t woke me up and he said, Traver, the little bastard's gone. We was there and that and we was leaning back in those tree shrubs all around us except the shell hole. And these two officers come and stood right up like this, about that far from their boots, about that far from our heads, and smoking and talking in German. And Ojuki reached up and touched one of them's boot just to see for the fun of it. He was that kind of a guy. We go out, my platoon, and it's daylight, and I got a couple of scouts out, and the scouts are fired on. The scout comes back to me and uh, says, Lieutenant, we've got an open field in front of us trying to decide which, which way we're going to go. And uh, we're on our ha haunches. Like, whoops, like so. And I'm talking to the scout. And uh, I look up, and here is a German helmet right behind the scout. And he sees me, realizes, See, we're behind their lines. We'd come through the minefield. He expects Germans to be there. He doesn't expect uh, American soldiers to be there. So he's completely shocked when he gets up to us. And I look up and I think he must have realized we were Americans at the moment I saw him. And we could still hear the Americans cussing and fighting out there trying to get to us. And about that time, here come eight crouched and they poked their heads up over the side of this big shell hole. They were crouched. And uh, so we were sitting there, Juki with his submachine gun, me and my BAR and Flynn with his O3. And I said, okay, Juki, what do you want to do? And he said, pardon me, F it. And they took us out. And that's when they got us out of that hole. They stripped us down and then they were going to kill Juki because he was just too frightening for him. And I talked him into not shooting. I told him, I said, I told this kid, he brought him up, brought him up. I said, we didn't shoot you, don't shoot him. And they got the message and they, they didn't. Men were taken as POWs by the German forces. They were held for almost four months. Juki reportedly tried to escape twice and made it home alive after the war. Flynn died while in a French hospital after his release. Traver sailed home a year after his capture on the anniversary of D-Day. The last night was the last day of, con of our combat. Uh, the last night, 2nd Battalion made a, a patrol down through the side of a ravine to try and get down to the Roar River. And the beginning of the uh, column, as I understand it, reached the road that was down at the bottom. We were up at the more or less the last ones. 
we made that last uh, trip down through that uh, gulge was about the size of a company. We, I think we had 13 men in F Company left. That stands out in my mind as one of the roughest uh, engagements that we had. Because usually we uh, were more successful. Then we learned later that maybe we were ordered to do this as a diversionary attack because they had something else in mind. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that wasn't the case. We pulled back and the, we found out that we were making a secondary effort or whatever you'd call it, a diversionary. Yeah. We could have done it with, le with less people getting hurt. In fact, the real mission had been to make the Germans believe the primary attack was near Bergstein, so the main forces could capture the town of Schmidt. The 517th accomplished this diversion all too well, but proved it a callous exportation of the troopers' drive and courage. In three days, the regiment lost over 500 men and a quarter of its rifle strength. Any credit for this victory belongs to the 517th as well as others. This would be the last battle they would fight as a combat team. By early April, the European war is coming to a close. Members of the 517th are scattered, some still healing from wounds, some discharged, and some assigned to other divisions. I got a letter from South France telling me that Louisette was up in a sanitarium, TB sanitarium. When we were told that we could go any place, Norway, Sweden, England, wherever we wanted to go as a reward for getting through it and staying alive. And I learned that Louisette was up in that sanitarium that the only thing I could do, I went up to that sanitarium to see her. And she uh, laughed and she cried, everything. It was uh, a very emotional time. And uh, I went up there and I stayed a day, or most of a day. And uh, then I left her. And of course, that was the last time I left and saw her. And then I got word that she did not survive. I'll never forget that trip back. And the, um, a lot of the ships in the harbor were uh, blowing their horns and, and sending up streams of water as a welcoming. I'll never forget it. They had traveled over 6,000 miles, fought in four countries, and paid for five campaigns with 1,500 casualties. The young enthusiasts who sailed from America three years earlier were no longer kids, now war-hardened men who each fought bravely for the battle of their lives and for our freedom. Although I commanded the 82nd and been in every damn airborne unit, the 517th where my heart is. We were as close as brothers. Without a question, we were as close as brothers. And, and many of us didn't. I have a sister, but I never had a brother. But all those guys were brothers. And to this day, we're, we're still just as close as that. The regiment was officially deactivated on February 25, 1946. But the team would live on in the textbooks of history and the spirit of the men of the 517th.